this patient's Udo, her life's goal is to impart joy and purpose into the lives of others by helping them correct, to correctly place the building blocks of their lives while guiding them to the point of fulfillment of destiny. She currently works with a diverse range of clients from white collar workers, freelancers to small business owners. She works with them to manage the resources that would affect their success, such as time, finances, manpower, as well as the quality of their Christian work. Some of the clients have their testimonials featured on our Instagram handle at Gifted Builder. She's also a wife and mother of three. So with this, I would like us to welcome Mrs. Patience Udo to speak to us on understanding, mentoring, and being mentored. Welcome, Ma. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. It's a great privilege to be here. Thank you so much um, for the warm welcome. You're thank you, welcome. Adeola. I can see your hand. Thank you, thank you. Um, I trust God that today he would use me as a mouthpiece. First of all, I want to appreciate you, Ma, for bringing me on board to be able to share some more. I also want to appreciate Mrs. Kemi Oyeliko, who was able to make this possible. And um, I just thank everyone else that is open to receiving whatever it is that God wants to speak through me. And I believe that will leave this place changed and transformed in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to hit the road running and I'm going to first share my screen. Yeah. Yes. So I'll share my screen so that we can all be connected. With, um, share. I believe you can all see my screen now. Yes. So today we're looking at, yes. as we have been told, understanding mentoring and being mentored. And that's my name, Patience Udo. And we're going to start straight away with the introduction. Um, I thank God because you've spoken a bit about mentoring, but for avoidance of doubt, I'll still go through it again. What exactly is mentoring. Where do we start from when we are talking about mentoring? Now, I've given it some definition so that we'll have something to clearly understand and clearly see. Now, mentoring is a voluntary endeavor of somebody who is more experienced, showing other people how to do something that would benefit them in one area or the other, give them progress in life, and it could be sharing of skill, it could be sharing of knowledge, it could be experiences, whatever it is, that person is sharing, is more experienced in that area and is showing another person how to get something done. It could also be seen as a deliberate, purposeful relationship to actually invest in the future of others. Because sometimes we find out that mistakes that we make are repeated one generation after the other. I believe that if everybody takes it upon themselves to invest in the area of mentoring in other people's lives, then it becomes easier for us to stop um, repeating the mistakes of generations. So that's basically what mentoring is all about. And the question which was partly answered also earlier is that is mentoring scriptural? Is it scriptural or is it something that we just, you know, coined up? Yes, mentoring is scriptural. Not only is it scriptural, but it's, it's also contemporary. So we have the example of Abraham that mentored Lot. The Bible says when Abraham was leaving, he picked Lot along with him. And then as Abraham was being uh, was prospering, Lot was prospering as well with him. And then we have the story of Moses and Joshua, the Bible talks about how Joshua followed Moses very closely. And even though Joshua was referred to as Moses' servant, at the end of the day, when there was a need to choose somebody to be where, to lead the children of Israel to the next phase, God was the one that said, choose um, Joshua, because Joshua actually carried the spirit that was inside Moses. So that showed that Joshua was not just a servant, but Joshua was actually 
somebody that was closely mentored by Moses. Sorry, I'm just going back to where we were before. And then we have the example of Eli, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah also, Elisha also was termed as Elijah's servant. But at the end of the day, we could see that it was not just a master-servant relationship because after Elijah was cut off and they were looking for a prophet that would be able to give direction, automatically they chose Elisha. Why? Because he had taken on the spirit of Elijah. Then an example that you mentioned also was the story of Naomi and Ruth. Ruth had no idea how to follow the God of the Israelites. But by working closely with Naomi, she was able to understand what it means to actually be, you know, an Israelite and was able to serve the living God. Then we have Paul mentoring Timothy. He mentions it again and again. Every time he's writing a letter, he'll say, I'm writing to my son, Timothy, my son, Timothy. So it showed from that example that Timothy was more than just somebody that uh, Paul took along. It was actually somebody that Paul was able to pour himself into. And then we look at a contemporary example, and I chose just one, which is Michael Faraday. Every one of us know at least a bit about Michael Faraday to know that he was somebody that introduced electricity to the world. And it's often said that Michael Faraday was a self-made man. But in reality, Michael Faraday was not self-made at all. He was actually mentored by another professor that is called Humphrey Davy. And it was when he took him on board, the ideas that Michael Faraday had were disjointed. Yes, he had a passion for science, particularly in that area, but he didn't know how to put it all together. But when this man took him under his umbrella, then he was able to bring out the potential that was in him. And today, we talk about Michael Faraday years after he has passed on. And so we're moving on then to us as individuals. Why do I need mentoring? Why can't I just be the person that I am? Because we're in the day, days of great achievements. Now, there's almost nothing that a man sets his mind to do that is not achievable. Now, there are things that were said yesterday, for instance, a man cannot go to the moon. That today we look back and wonder, why did they think that? Because today is a cheap possibility. So all those yesterday's impossibilities have become possibilities today. And even in our lives, the things that maybe our parents were not able to achieve, it's a cheap possibility to us. Unfortunately, with all these achievements, man has come to the point where, or we're gradually getting to the point that we think we don't need anybody else to rise. Yet there is no man that can make it without another man in one capacity or the other. And that's why Proverbs 11 and verse 14 tells us that where there's no counsel, the people will fall. But it's in the multitude of counselors that there is safety. Yes, you have great ideas. Yes, you might have you know, things that tell you that you'll be able to make it without anybody. But stop and think. There's something else that somebody knows that you don't know yet until you get that person's counsel on board, you might struggle in an area where you shouldn't be struggling. And also the next scripture tells us, it says, without counsels, counsel, purposes are disappointed. Yes, you have great ideas, but if you don't have the right counsel, some of those purposes might not see the light of day, but it's in the multitude of counselors that those purposes are established. And then we have Proverbs 1, 5 that tells us that it's a wise man that will hear and increase learning. And it was ironic that one of those times when I was reading through the scripture and I found that, that even though Solomon was the wisest man by scriptural standard, Solomon actually had counselors. Solomon had, actually had people that were mentoring him, that were showing him the way to go. And that taught me something, that you never get to a point where you have all the answers. There's always something that know, somebody that knows something that you don't know. And it is wisdom to be able to hear and then increase learning. But for the purpose of giving us something to go home with, 
I want to just give us three major broad reasons why we can say we actually need mentoring. Number one, it's for the purpose of guidance. A mentor is there to teach you. A mentor is there to guide you, to counsel you, so that you don't make avoidable mistakes. The second reason is for the purpose of accountability. A mentor keeps you accountable. You have somebody that you are reporting to. You have somebody that is pushing you to meet targets. Because sometimes you wake up and you really don't feel like striking at that target that you've said before. You, you don't want to do it. But when you know that you are answerable to somebody, that pushes you to push yourself to meet that target. And that mentor becomes like an accountability partner. The third broad reason why you need a mentor, it's for the purpose of reference. You have somebody that has a wealth of experience and can keep you aligned with what is required for you to attain success. We've heard this quote again and again, and it's from Isaac Newton. He said, if we have seen further at all, it's by riding on the shoulders of those that have gone before us. So these people's wealth of experience has, has been able to keep us in line and direct us towards that success that we can see, but we really don't know how to get there. And that brings us clearly to the next question. So now that I know, where do I start from when I want to do mentoring? Number one, locate a mentor. Because you need to be able to, first of all, check yourself in locating a mentor. You need to be able to identify the areas of your life that you need support in order to go far. If you don't know the area, there are people who meet um, other people who are mentors, and they say, I want you to mentor me. And the mentor asks, which area do you want me to mentor? And I just want you to mentor me generally. There's nothing like general mentoring. You need to be able to identify an, an area where you know, I need support in this area. Maybe you are struggling in the area of marriage. Maybe you are struggling in the area of the peculiarity of your career. Maybe you are struggling in one area, even child raising, and you, you could do with some help. It's that area that you look for somebody or areas that you then look for people that you can connect with that can then support you. The second thing you should do is now prayerfully check around. Don't just go out for anybody, the first person that crosses your mind. Because sometimes people, they say talk is cheap. And when you hear them talk, you think, no, this person knows what the person is doing. But check around first. Identify if that person actually carries the grace or the ability that you desire, or that person is just very you know, eloquent in the way they speak. And then you check their lives also for integrity. Do these people have what I am looking for? So that it's not just that it's a, a, there are those kind of people that say, do what I say, but don't do what I do. If that's the case, then that person is not the right person to be able to mentor you. And that's where the area of prayer comes in. Don't just jump out and go and pick the first person that occurs to you. Go in the place of prayer and ask God, is this the person? And get that release in your spirit that this is the person that you should reach out to. And then check the person's life for integrity. Then you can then be inspired. Now begin to create a mental picture of the possibilities that are available to you by looking at the life of that mentor. If that mentor is truly the person that can add value to your life, in that area, the person should definitely have results. And that's one thing you should do. That leads us to the point of, okay, so now I have got all that and I'm ready to move on. What do I do next? Number one, you meet with your mentor. Now, the mentor might be way out of your reach physically. Yes, but there are people that, um, there are materials that is out there, that are out there, that you can actually use to connect to the people. There are maybe other people that know the people that you can also connect with, but go out of your way. Some people, because of fear of what if they reject me, that fear of rejection actually keeps those people 
in that area of stagnation, no, you need to take a step to meet with their men your mentor and then read their materials. Ensure that these people are proven authors in the area they are talking about. That means you can see proof of what they are writing in their own lives. And because you don't have physical access to them, but you can find information about them. And then sometimes they have blogs, sometimes they have write-ups that you can connect with and just begin to drink from the wealth of their experience. Now, what that does is that the Holy Spirit has a, his own way of connecting you physically with these people. It might start out by you just connecting with their materials only, but at some point, somehow, somewhere, you will get to meet with them. So keep drinking out of whatever it is, the grace that God has loaded inside them. And number three thing that must be a lifestyle with you is to observe these people. Because observation will teach you a lot more about a person than just what they say. There are so many things that you can really only learn that you cannot be taught. For instance, you're looking at, you know, to somebody who needs to mentor you in the area of marriage, for instance. Maybe the person is male, maybe the person is female. It might just be a little act of, you know, they never raise their voice when they talk to the person. But that person might not be able to tell you that that's one of, the things she does or he does. But suddenly you notice that whenever this person is speaking, there is a calmness with which they communicate to their spouse. That alone can teach you something. You might be somebody who is very pushy and a go-getter. And you suddenly realize that, you know what, I need to mellow down in this area because you have taken time to observe how that person actually relates with their spouses observation does teach you a lot now what is the step-by-step -step process that you can actually imbibe when it comes to mentoring number one be prayerful about who you follow it's very very important now the fact that a person may be an accomplished pilot for instance does not mean that that person can give you the best relationship advice that you need the fact that that person is wonderful in one area or the other might not make them necessarily the right mentor for you. That's why you have to be prayerful. And every time you're about to take a step and you notice that there's a check in you, then slow down. Take a step back and find out why is there that check. The second thing that you must be ready for is be ready for criticism. This is one thing nobody wants to be shown you know, that bad part of themselves. You can look at yourself in the mirror and it's just you and yourself and you can handle that. But when it comes for, to, from somebody else, it's something that, you know, drives you up, rubs you off the wrong way. But you must be ready to receive some hard truths about yourself. A mentor is not meant to treat you as a friend. A mentor is not meant to say sweet things to you, no. A mentor is there to help you to shape and mold your life in that area where you need help. And sometimes he or she might not be able to do so if they have to focus on not causing you pain, not causing you hurt. So toughen up and be ready for, for constructive criticism because if that person is truly a mentor and they give you some form of criticism, there will always there will always be like a solution, a key, an answer inside, embedded inside that criticism. But if all you can hear is that I'm not good enough in this area, which you already know anyway, that's why you're coming to get a mentor. But if all you are hearing is that, you might not even find out that the key to the change you're looking for is in that thing that they are sharing with you. And then the third thing you must be ready for is be ready to be stretched be ready to leave your comfort zone because you must be ready for radical change in some areas if truly you're meeting that person because that person carries something that will be of profit to you it's very strange sometimes when you meet mentors and you're trying to share some things with them trying to tell them some things and they're arguing with you and telling you how much 
you don't understand me. Man, you don't understand. This is how I am. The reason why I do this is because of this. Okay, if you had all the answers, why are you coming to me? It's because you need answers. That's why you have come to me. So if truly you are ready for change, then be ready to listen. Be ready to stretch. They might ask you to do certain things. I mean, a typical example, biblical example, is the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was one hard man to follow. There are so many times, even Elijah himself attempted to discourage Elisha. But no, El Eli Elisha kept sticking on to the very end until he got what he wanted. So you must know that you will be stretched and be ready for that stretch. Because mentoring, the purpose of mentoring is actually to give you a positive growth. And there's no growth without a stretch. It will demand more from you than you really want to give at every point in time. Because if you could do it yourself, you really won't need that extra push from another person. So one thing we ask you is make sure that you are never the same with your mentor after you leave your mentor. If you are the same after days, months, even years of being with this person, then you have not been stretched, you have not grown, and you have wasted your time. So be ready for a stretch. The fourth thing you must bear in mind is be observant. And that means be a person. Is somebody saying something? The fourth point is to be observant. Be a person of few words. Very few mentors will actually sit down and discuss everything they know with you because everybody also has things that they are doing. They might be busy. So be ready to observe their habits. I've mentioned this before. Be ready to observe the things that they do that make them stand out in a certain area. And the fifth thing you must do is to be sensitive. Be sensitive. If a mentor is not adding any value to you. Wisdom demands that you end that relationship. And if you are worse off at that point in time before, as compared to how you were before the relationship started, then that person is actually retro, retrogressive to your life. So wisdom demands that you end that relationship if it's not adding any value to you. So be sensitive. But if it's adding value to you, then Train yourself to glean more and more from that person. And the sixth point you must bear in mind is that you should be ready to learn completely. Learn totally from that person. Be ready to learn from their right choices. Be ready to learn from their mistakes. Now, if a person tells you what they did that caused them to fail, maybe in their marriage, maybe in their career, maybe in all their any other area of their life. That means you should not fail in that area. Now, some people use that to console themselves and tell themselves, okay, so my mentor has failed. Okay, that means I can fail as well. No, no. The reason why that person is sharing their mistake with you is so that you don't walk their path. Now, there are so many things that I did not start to do early in my marriage, simply because I didn't, I wasn't open to the kind of counseling, the kind of, you know, um, support that is available, readily available now to people before they go into marriage. Now, those mistakes, those areas of mistakes, those areas of assumption that I went into, I share with my daughters. I have teenage daughters and I tell them, you have to start early where I started late. Because if you wait to start where I started from, then I have failed. So my progress is that you are able to avoid the pitfalls that I didn't see, that I fell into. So be ready as you learn from your mentor to learn from the right choices, grab it, and then ensure that their mistakes are not repeated in your life. And the seventh thing and the final thing is you must be meek. Be determined to remain humble and teachable. Because sometimes you are trying to share some things with some mentees 
But they, before you speak, they complete what you're saying. And they want to take it from there and then teach you. And you begin to wonder, okay, so if you have the answers, why are you asking me? So it's as if they are more ready to share what they know than they are ready to glean from you what you know. But if you are too knowledgeable and you want to teach everybody around you, including your mentor, then you're not going to learn much. It takes that grace, that step of being quiet to be able to learn from somebody that has gone before you. And that's the only way that the grace of God will keep flowing in your direction. But one that is proud, and some people go on with, you know, why is she talking to me like that? Why is she sharing that? Why is she asking that of me? Why is she, why is he? If you have the answers, then take the walk and do it yourself. But you don't know that's why you are coming. Now, there was something when I was reading of the um, autobiography of um, the man that um, introduced electricity to us. Uh, when he was working under his mentor, the professor Humphrey Davy, there's something that they said. He said he was always threatened by the success of his mentee because suddenly, because he was a hungry person, because he was driven towards success, towards making a mark in his life, he pushed himself and pushed himself. So the things that even the mentor does not know, he knew it. Michael Faraday was covering grounds that Humphrey David had not even touched. And there was a point in that autobiography that it says that it was as if Humphrey wanted to then put him down, sort of cage him in, because so that he won't become more popular than himself. But that did not stop um, Michael Faraday from pushing. That did not stop Michael Faraday by putting himself under authority, by learning under that man. And at the end of the day, until when he passed on, that was when Michael Faraday now stepped into his shoes in that um, institute, and then was now able to do all those things that he really wanted to do, all those experiments, all those things he wanted, options he wanted to explore. He didn't subvert authority. He didn't want to push that man down so that he can step into his place. No, 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 he waited. And you can see that in somebody like David. So many times, everybody would push David to say, God has already said you're going to be king. Allow me just slay this man just once and you'll be there. But David will always say, wait, my time will come. Now, it might look as if you are a nobody now. Whoever you're looking up to as a mentor is being celebrated. You might even, there might even be some things that in the process of the person sharing with you, she or he is learning. And the person is not giving you credit for it. Don't worry. Just keep yourself in that place of meekness make yourself teachable. Learn what you need to learn. That is the only way that when the time comes, you will find your way at the top. And that brings us to a very crucial question that people normally ask. Is it right to pay for advice? Is it right to pay for mentoring? And I want to start this by looking at the area from, from an angle of the Bible. Kings paid fees to Solomon. And how do I know that? If you look at the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 23 all the way to 24, I like the way that the New Living Translation says it. He says, kings from every nation came to consult him and to hear the wisdom that God had given him. Now that, you can either see that as mentoring or you can see that as coaching. But year after year, everyone without exception who visited him brought him gifts of silver, of gold, of clothing, of all sorts. So they came in to learn from him, yes, but they didn't come in empty-handed. They brought in something to, as it were, what you might want to call consultation fee. Why? Because the kings knew the value of Solomon's wisdom. They came to be mentored by him so that the kind of exploits that Solomon was experiencing 
they also could experience it. And when they came, they were bringing their fees with them. Now, the second aspect of that that we can see is also the story of Solomon. And you know, I mentioned it earlier. I said, from the Bible, I found out that there were people that Solomon was consulting when he was alive. Yes, God had told him that he will, he will be the wisest, his wisdom will have no equal anywhere. But the Bible says that there were these older men that served as his father's advisors. Now, if you are to put it in today's language, there are mentors that Solomon had on retainership. Now, that is a new thing for a lot of us. I will begin to ask, ha, so the, you, need, you can pay for um, intellectual knowledge. Yes, the process of paying for intellectual knowledge and experience is not new. Now, why do people have to pay for advice? Number one, it takes time and energy on the aspect of the person who is sharing with you. It takes time and energy on the person, on the part of that person. And number two, it is of value to you. You are coming to them to receive light, information, and everything that they have to share with you. So it's costing them something and it's adding value to you. And it's also to show appreciation of the deposit of the experience that you did not need to personally go through yourself. And that's why Paul writing, he says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a big deal if we reap your carnal things? Because if others are partakers of this power over you, are we not rather? But you see, Paul decided, he said, nevertheless, we have not used this power. Nevertheless, we will not embrace this. We will not use this advantage of taking um, payment from you. Now, there are people that are like Paul, that choose not to receive anything when they are mentoring you or when they are taking you through. Now, this is a matter of personal preference, especially where spiritual counseling and mentoring is concerned. So I want everyone here to leave this place that if you meet somebody who is taking payment, it's not that the person is wrong. It's just that in the spiritual setting, a number of us have decided to do this freely at no charge because we understand that it is God that will give us the blessing that we're looking up to him for. So, and then you could decide to connect with, you might decide to these options that are available to you with all this that you know now is number one, you can decide to approach a mentor and enter into an arrangement with that mentor at that point, that person might decide to do it for free or let you know the kind of arrangement that is acceptable to them. Or you could meet people who do it as a charitable cause. So they do it for free. So it's possible that they will take you through. And the third group of people, which is where most of us actually fall under, is that we connect with someone we believe in. And then a relationship grows out of that. Now, some of us don't really have a name for that relationship. And some people feel uncomfortable to give it a name. But whether you give it a name or not, that relationship is actually a mentoring relationship. So that person then naturally slips into the role of being your mentor. And you slip into that role of being the mentee. So the reason why I'm laying all this out is to tell you that you can either decide to do it officially, you can either approach people who are more than willing to do it, or you could grow into it in a relationship with somebody. So the options are quite, quite many for us to um, embrace and go into. And then that brings us to the point of understanding what is the difference? Because sometimes people with what we've said now, people get confused. Okay, so what's the difference between giving advice? What's the difference between having somebody as a coach? And what's the difference between having somebody mentor you? And this is why I've decided to lay out a clear difference so that we leave this place with no iota 
of confusion at all. Who is a coach? Who is a mentor? I'll give us a broad definition. A mentor is an experienced, simply put, is an experienced or a trusted advisor. Somebody who gives you advice, but that person has experience in that area. Now, if you notice, we didn't say an older person. Your mentor does not have to be older than you. Your mentor can be younger than you, but the person is experienced in the area you're looking for guidance, you're looking for direction. And the person, why we use the word trusted, is because the person has actually put to work whatever principles they are passing on to you, whether officially or in any other way. They have put it to work and they are trusted in that area. So they are actually trusted advisors. Now that is a mentor. And the, a coach on the other hand is somebody that is actually partnering with another person through a process that is thought provoking and creative. In other words, you might come to the person and say, you know, I have issues managing my time and I don't know, I have all this to-do list, but every time I try, I hit a brick wall. The person decides, okay, let me have a look at this, your to-do list. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to prioritize your to-do list. We're going to take you through a process where you try not to overwhelm yourself with this, your to-do list. Try and do, take only the first three. Let that be your your mark of success in a day. Do pick three and make sure you achieve three. Now, those three become your point of success, your point of achievement for that day. Now, that person is partnering with that particular person and leading the person to think through and to be creative. Instead of just pick your to do list, hold it here and do it. Now, true coaches actually work with you to be able to bring out your ability within you. And that's why we talk about maximizing either your personal or your professional potential. So they are taking you through these processes and they are helping you to be able to see, you know what, I can do it. But it's not just a broad confession of, yes, just keep telling yourself, I will make it. Yes, tell yourself I'm the head and not the, no. It goes beyond that to begin to say, oh, so the reason why I am struggling in this area is because I have been, you know, overwhelming myself because I don't even know what I am able to carry part time. So I'm overwhelming myself with everything that I'm carrying on board. That is what a coach does. Now, in order, that's according to the International Coach Federation. Now, in order to make it easier, I am actually wrapping up by sharing these tables with us that show us a broader comparison of mentoring and coaching. Now we've seen that both of them do give advice. So that advice is sort of a running theme that runs through with every mentoring and every coaching session. Now for the mentor, it's usually a long-term arrangement. It's, it could be one year, two years more. If you look at um, cases like the examples we brought out, Ruth and Naomi, it was for years that they were together. If you look at Elijah and Elisha, it's for longer than two years. If you look at, you know, Timothy and Paul, it was for years and years they were working together. But with coaching, it's usually short term, six years to one year. Sometimes in rare cases, it goes longer. But what happens with coaching is that sometimes people get so comfortable working with their coach and bringing out their potential in them that they actually grow into becoming a mentor and a mentee. So they might approach the person first as a coach, then it graduates to that level. Now concerning mentoring, the focus is always individual development, like the person needs help in the area of family, for instance, in the area of career, in the area of 
coping with a business. Every time she starts a small or he or she starts a small business, it falls apart. Every time she starts, it falls apart. So now that person needs a, a mentor in that area that would sort of guide them through step by step. But with the coaching in that same setting, business setting, the, the relationship will focus on performance and result with clear cut outcomes. For instance, now you're coming to me and you're telling me, you know, I don't know why my business is stagnated. It's like, I can see money, but I don't know where the money is going to. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, do you have where you are putting the details of what is coming in, in its simple form and what is going out? If you have that, can you give me an idea of what your, your table or whatever simple process you normally use is for the past six months, for the past one year? If you can, then I then look at where, where there are glitches, where there are issues. And so we begin to follow clearly agreed templates with clear performance indices. So you are saying that if you can hit this goal, this is success. If you fall below this area, this is not success. Now that's coaching. Now with mentoring, the meetings are fixed on a need to meet basis. Sometimes it could be impromptu. So it's not necessarily structured. But with coaching, you have clear cut catch up times. They are spelled out with clear outcomes that must be evaluated at the point where you meet up. So it might be monthly, it might be weekly. But with your mentor, you could just decide to give the person a call and say, you know what, I've been struggling with this in this area and I've discussed this with my husband, but this is where I am. Or I've discussed this with my wife, this is where I am. Or you know what, I'm struggling in this area. And the person at that point will just give you advice on the go or refer you to a material that you can use on the go. So it's not clearly structured. That is mentoring and coaching. And also um, continue with that definition Often it is the mentee that determines the area of need where he or she wants to tap into the experience of the mentor for. So the person knows that I am struggling in this area and this is what I need and goes to actually try and glean that thing that he or she needs from the mentor. But in coaching, it is the coach and the coachee that must agree on targets to be met in specific areas of need. Now, the person might come in thinking that his area of need is because his, his or her business is located in an area that there's no crowd, in an area that is not a highbrow area, in an area that is this or that. But the coach, when looking at the details and the information, the data, that is available to him or her would see that that's not the problem. The problem is that there's no clear cut outlet for your resources when they come in. So in other words, your person and your business is intertwined. So it becomes very difficult for your business to make any headway because it's all tangled up together. So then the, the coach then decides to deal with those specific areas of entanglement and untangles it. Now with mentoring, most questions, number five, are put forward by the mentee or it's the mentee that will initiate that observation that he or she needs. Is the mentee that will decide that, you know what, in this area, I know I've learned this, but I still need help in this area or I still need help in that area. But in the coaching, the coach might, on the other hand, look at the feedback he or she is getting from you and then will prompt, encourage, and guide the one that is coached by giving that person assignments, by giving that person reviews that both of them sit down together to talk on, to review, to deal with, and then make a way forward. So that is, there are so many other differences, but I think this one is enough to clarify for us the differences between mentoring and coaching. So you can easily ask yourself, am I being coached or am I being mentored? So at this point, I think I will stop sharing. Wow, thank you so <laughs> much. 
that was awesome that was awesome very educating and eye-opening thank you so much ma'am we really thank appreciate you. you um i think generally the area of mentoring and um coaching and being a mentee is one that uh, we cannot overlook and that's one of the reasons i'm really happy that we've discussed this tonight i will open up the floor to whoever wants to ask a question please uh, put your questions in the chat box uh, or unmute yourself and let us just go into the q a session and um let's ask some questions from what we have heard it might be some questions that you've thought about before or some questions that has pop up to you as the teaching was going on i just want to um ask you know, from what you've said in the past few minutes, ma'am, yes. will you say that um, it's possible to have a merge of both being a mentor and being a coach? Yes, I would say that because there are times when your relationship starts off on a mentoring um, platform you are a mentor, the other person is a mentee. But at, at a particular point, that relationship is graduating because you need to help that person get proper structure in certain areas. Now that demands using certain um, templates, certain um, items that you use to help the other person to grow or, or to develop in that particular area. So it's mm -hmm. possible for it to make, but in most cases, it's, it's, it's clearly defined. You will know when you are a mentor or a mentee. It's only in rare cases that there is that evolution. The same thing, somebody who approaches a coach, for instance, knows when they are at that point where their business or their enterprise or their time management skill is now actually at the level where they, they are comfortable, at the level where they say, yes, we can make it. So they don't need at that point to graduate to being a, men, a mentee mm -hmm. under that particular coach. But mm -hmm. some people feel, you know, this person is loaded with so much more than what he or she has shared with me. And I am ready to take this relationship to the next level. Now, one of the things we make very clear is that if you want your relationship to graduate to the next level, it must really be, it, maybe you start off being just um, people, friends, or people in church growing up together, but you suddenly find that you want this relationship to move to the next level. Mm -hmm. Let it be at, that it's the men, mentor that actually opens the door for you to come in. So you might want to test the waters to find that because somebody might be uncomfortable with relating with you beyond being um, a coachee. It, it, the person might be uncomfortable now taking you on as a mentor because now you are going into a deeper form of relationship. You mm -hmm. must be able to come to that point where you know that the person is ready to open the door for you to come mm -hmm. into his or her space. But yes, sometimes it flows from one to the other. Oh, yes, that's, that's very good. Thank you so much. Um, and also, I was just thinking about it. Are we, is it safe to summarize um, and to conclude and say that mentoring uh, is more mentee driven while coaching is more, you know, the coach driven? Yes, I would say that's a, a, a good way of summarizing it because it is the mentee that will determine the area that they actually need help. Mm. Um, it's not really, a lot of times, most mentors are just doing their own thing. They don't even know that you're observing them. They don't even know that you're looking up to them to have something. They're, they're just being themselves. And suddenly you said, I like your grace. I like your ability to connect with people. I, I am shy, I, I can't, I see you come into a place where you don't know anybody and suddenly your aura fills the room, not in a domineering way, but in a way where, you know, you're you are so warm. Now, I want that warmth that you have. 
So it's the men mentee that would then approach the mentor and say, I like this aspect of your life, this grace upon your life, and I want it. So it's mostly um, driven by the mentee. However, mm -hmm. with coaching, yes, it's still the coachee that must know that I have a need. But a lot of times, the coach does, the coachee doesn't even know the area they need help. Mm -hmm. They just know that my life is like everywhere. I just need help. I just, some people come to me and I say, what's the problem? They say, I don't know. Everything is just upside down. So mm -hmm. at that point, it is the coach, a, a coach who knows his or her onions that has to help that person say, this is where the area of challenge is. And you don't just go and start telling the person, with your experience, you help the person first calm down and let the person have hope that this thing is not as um, impossible. It's not as messy as you think it is. Yes. It's possible for us to walk through. So it's the coach that then takes that initiative to then guide the person through how to achieve that ultimate outcome. The person might not even have a name for that outcome, but they know what that outcome is. So a coach that is successful is when the coachee at the end of the day looks back and say, yes, this is the picture I had in mind when I was coming to you. That person has become successful. Now, the, the real assignment of a coach is to empower the other person to be able to stand on their feet and be able to help themselves in that area that they came to them for help for. Mm. 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 Amazing. That's really good. All right, people, the floor's open. This is the time to ask questions because in the next few minutes, by the time we pray and we end it, that's it. No more opportunities to ask questions. So this is your time. Please go ahead and ask ask the questions you have in the areas of mentoring and being a mentor. Is anyone speaking yet? Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you, madam. <laughs> it was wonderful and eye-opening. Thank you. I just want to ask you, do you have a mentor for yourself as well? Do I have? A mentor for yourself. A mentor. Myself. Have yes, a, I, yeah. yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have mentors in different areas. Yes. Okay. And what, how we can persuade a mentor if he's not like, is not okay to mentor us, hmm. how we can persuade them or how we can convince them. Yeah, sometimes some people for some reason would, maybe they have been beaten before or hmm. um, betrayed before or disappointed before by somebody that they've taken under their wings. And because of that, because they also are human beings, so they are uncomfortable with now taking somebody else on board. So at that point, you need to, as a mentee, you need to be patient with that mentor. You need to bring the person to that point where you're actually letting the person see for themselves that they are safe with you. Because if the other person came in and they opened their arms to the other person and opened up themselves, because a mentor also have to share some intimate part of their lives with you, so, and if when they share those things that they thought they are trying to encourage you with, they hear it on the news, then they, have, they feel betrayed. So they might not want to open up in that area. So it would take the mentor to, who is desperate for what they carry to mm -hmm. gradually follow them up. Start by, you know, sending them messages that they are safe to respond to you with. Like, don't start by turning up in, their, in front of their door and say, hi, I've come to meet with you today. No, you know, you don't do that. So you need to first send a message, you know, somehow comment on something they have written, you know, take their materials, read, send them a feedback, how it has blessed you. Just little, little steps like that, that they now understand after a period of time that, okay, this person is for real. If you also look at the story of, you know, Elisha and Elijah, the first time that God made Elijah to actually choose Elisha, and Elisha was like, can you give me some time? Let me just sort this out and then come with you. Elijah was like, whatever, do whatever you want. Like, 
what do I have to do with you? You know, but Elisha was patient enough mm -hmm. to say, you know what, I'll follow this man. Even when he was brash to him and harsh, he kept following. Even when they got to the point where he knew Elisha wanted something from him, he, he still tried to discourage Elisha, but Elisha could not be discouraged because that grace upon his life, he mm -hmm. needed it. Yeah. So for the sake of that grace that he was pursuing, he endured everything. And at the end of the day, you know, the Bible tells us that as in water, mm. face answers to face. That's how the heart of a man answers to that of his friend in that scripture. So if you are genuinely following somebody, at the end of the day, it will show that mm. you are there, not for what you can get, not because that person has a name, not because you want to take advantage of that person, but because your heart is genuinely panting to, you know, receive something from that person and he will willingly, you know, flow out to you. So that for me would be the steps you should take. And it would take patience on the part of the mentee. Patience, loads yeah. of patience. Thank you, madam. Yep. Yeah. Mm. That's fantastic. Okay, what I'm going to do now, we're going to take some um written questions right. and if there's anyone who's you know getting ready to ask your own questions still i uh, will we'll still have time for you whether you want to unmute yourself and say that or you want to put it in the chat box all right one the first written question regarding the cost of mentoring and being mentored how can a mentor or mentee remain resilient and committed through the challenges that come with mentoring? Um, I believe an example of this will be when the mentors, um, mentors are not meant to be friends to their mentees. When the mentor, for example, is giving some instructions or um, expecting the mentee to, you know, be, be more, um, uh, thirsty when it comes yeah. to knowledge or seek them or things like that. So how can, on both sides, how can, especially for the mentee, how can they remain resilient and committed to being mentored? Okay. Um, that I think it's good that you clarified the, an example of the areas where there could be challenges. And that is in the area where maybe the mentor, for instance, is too busy even. Mm. that's a problem and the mentee is following up the mentor but the person is too busy or like you said the mentee himself or herself is not following through it's a matter of finding common ground because when a mentor and a mentee come together to begin this mentoring relationship it's a journey that they've not taken together before now, they could have taken the journey with some other person. It, it, they've not walked this path before. And because of that, they need to understand that they must find common ground. Now, if the men, mentor has come to a point now of accepting the other person, like I've used the tips, I've shared the tips with Anu on how you can get your mentor to actually come to the point of accepting to mentor you. If the mentor has come to that point of acceptance, but then the mentor is not following through, it's then up to the mentee to find that everybody has a point where you can touch them. Everybody has a point where you can reach them. Everybody has a way you can speak to them and they will understand what you mean. Now, you don't walk up to them and say, I don't understand you these days. You don't have time for me. This is unfair on me. Now, the minute you do that, you are going the you know, blaming roots and it won't work for you and it won't help the mentor. So find common ground. Let the mentor, ask the mentor, for instance, are you more comfortable with me sending you texts? Are you more comfortable with me, you know, just sending you messages rather than calling you? Or do you have a particular time when it's good for me to call so we can talk? Or are you a face-to-face -face person? So you are asking that person to let you know the best way that you can relate with the person. And then if it's the situation of where the men mentee is also proving difficult, should I say, 
I think the mentor in this case who has decided to be the more mature one should understand that mm -hmm. that mentee is coming to you because that person is carrying a baggage, a lot of, you know, weight on them. So sometimes mm -hmm. the things we carry and the things we deal with make us not too pleasant to be with. So look beyond the person's reaction and behavior to actually mm -hmm. wanting to be a blessing to that person. So sometimes I, I've had somebody that I work with this mentor-mentee relationship with that she could be, when we first started, she was very hot-headed. And there was one of those times she had issues with her husband and she was quite upset. And then, you know, I called because I knew that at that point she needed a word. And she said, what do you want? And I'm like, it's me talking. He said, I know it's you. What do you want? I'm like, I've come to pray with you. I just want to pray with you. I just want you to know that God is on your side. I just want you to know that God will not give up on you. Now, by the time I finished talking with her, she broke down. She started crying. Now, but if I was to respond by, first, I'm older than her. Secondly, she's the one that approached me for this relationship. So how can I pick up the phone, try to reach you? And you know, yes, I want to mediate in the issue that is happening to you. And the first thing you're asking me is, what do you want? And I'm thinking, okay, maybe you don't know I'm the one on the line. It's me. Yeah. Said, I know, but what do you want? So I'm like, okay, no problem. At that point, that person is going through something. So if a mentor has the heart of a mother or a father, no matter, even if the other person is older, then that person will create that room for that person to actually grow and grow out of those negative traits. So I think that's one thing. Finding common ground is mm. the key. Fantastic. Thank you so much. The next question, there is someone I know who I am, who is older than me and has a lot of experience. I think this is a bit similar to what, uh, what yeah, I asked I earlier. Yeah. I feel that she has a lot to give, but she's very reserved and not outspoken at all. Could it be that some potential mentors need to be geared up and is it advisable to go to this person in order to draw knowledge out of them? Yes, yes. I, I would say yes, it's like I said to Anu, yes, it's possible that you are the one that would need to pull that person out of that zone of being very reserved. Mm. And when it comes to going to the person in order to draw knowledge, because that person is reserved and out, not outspoken at all, if you budge into the person's space, the person will feel threatened. Mm. Because first, the person is not feeling maybe um, as if she has what you need or he or she has what you need. The person is probably feeling inadequate to be able to mentor you because maybe that person has not done it before. So the person is, needs help for you to be able to, unless the person begins to get positive feedback from you, Mm -hmm. then the person's confidence begins to grow. So in that kind of case, the minute you want to go to the person, ensure that you go to the person on the person's terms. Mm -hmm. If the person says, I'm usually very busy, it's all easy for me to text um, and respond to text, then please start by texting. Don't decide in the middle of text to just call the person up. No, the person is not okay to talk. Send a text. Is it okay if I can call you now? Or would you have me call you later? So what you're doing, you're you are giving that person a chance to accept you. And then once you get to that place, begin to give the person a regular feedback on the impact of whatever she, he or she is sharing with you. Let the person know, you know, this is what I realized. I never knew that, you know, silence is really golden in marriage until I put to work something you told me to do. And I did this. And for the first time, this is the feedback that I got from my spouse. Wow. I never knew that, you know, raising teenagers, it's not a suicide mission. Do you know that that thing you told me to do, I tried it with my teenagers and see the response. Now that person is encouraged to say, yes, I'm impacting a life. And that person will be encouraged to give you more. You're not telling lies, but every time you get results, 
get back to the person and let the person know I've had the result. That positive feedback will build the person's confidence more and more. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for sharing such deep wisdom with us tonight. This is, this is really good. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more uh, written question. And still, people on the call on Zoom, um, if you have questions, you need to, you really need to ask now. I'm going to take this question and then ask again if you have questions, then you can air your questions. All right, what happens if there's a clash in personality between the mentor and the mentee? Yeah. Now, it depends on, like I said before, the mentor and the mentee are going into a relationship that they've not been through mm -hmm. before. And yes, the person is a mentor. The person might not even have experience in mentoring. Mm -hmm. But in that case, I think one person has to be the more mature one. For instance, if you find out that because the person who is mentoring you is a very, doesn't know how to, you know, be nice mm. and get oh. truthful. There are people that say, that video you did online was total rubbish. You don't speak like that. You are not even looking at the camera. What were you thinking? So at that point, the tendency is for you to go into your shell and just let the ground swallow you up. But you need to know that that person has a skill you need. So you need to endure that. Of course, we mentioned that you are ready, ready for criticism. Now, that's the person's way of saying it. No, what you are saying is rubbish. Just say, please, can I explain so that or how else, how better can I say it? Like, for instance, I notice when you do your own videos, this is how you do it. Is there something that you do that I'm not doing? Can you tell me? Can you help me? You need to ignore that, you know, that thing you did is nonsense. You need to ignore that and ask the question that you need because that person is a different person from you. That person has a different mm -hmm. temperament from you. So that person it might not be like you so you need to be able to have an understanding so it takes understanding and it has to come from one end either from the mentor or from the mentee whenever there's a clash in personality but of course if for instance mm -hmm. you are a mentee and every time the mentor sort of tears you down you get back up and then he tears you down and you get back up at a point, you will notice that that situation is eroding your confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, we mentioned something on the slide. If that relationship is destroying you, then end it. But if it's just somebody that doesn't know how to relate with another person and is naturally brash, you can still go past that. And then as your relationship grows, find a way of letting that person know that the person can also be more gentle in the way they pass across information to you. But it must start with one person being the mature one to be able to accommodate that. But if that person's personality is really eroding the relationship, then you need to end the relationship. Now, if the mentor, for instance, you have a mentee that is constantly, before you say something, they tell you, I know, I know what mm. you mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that and then they, they spend the next 15 minutes lecturing you and then you say oh what do you think and then you try to say something and say it's true you know in fact the last time that that happened you know I, I i know these things because i've had this experience before you see there was a time when i was now even you you are looking like you know I don't, no. I don't, so but if that men, mentee is that kind of person that maybe that's the natural trait of the person and the person doesn't know how to deal with you, you can help that person. But if the person is constantly, I have the answers, I just need somebody to rubber stamp what I'm doing, then that person is not coming to you to be mentored. So at that point, you need to also end the relationship. When the person sends you a message, you need to let the person know, I am busy, I will not be able to have this meeting. So at that point, you know, it's because you have explored all the options of finding common ground and there is no common ground, then you end the relationship. Mm. Mm. That's, that's good. 
Someone's asking in the chat box, um, does a mentor or coach have to be older? And somebody has answered, I know has answered no, but they have to be an experienced and trusted person, something we mentioned before, because what you're going for the, to the mentor for is to be able to glean from their experience or their skill or their technical know-how or something that they have that places them at an advantage over you, not for their age. Nobody goes to another person to be mentored, tell me how to be older. No, you just, is either tell me how you do this so effortlessly, tell me how you get this result. That's what you're going for. So the coach or the mentor could actually be way younger than you. Mm. So it's possible. Mm. But they must be experienced in that area that you're going for. Some people decide that because um, me and my friend have come a long way, um, and she's always sharing these ideas. That person can be my mentor. No, she might not have experience in that area. For instance, I'll use a very broad, random example. Like you are married, you've been married for like 10 years. Then that person is not married at all, but it's, they are having marriage classes. Really, you, unless that person has experienced those things, they mm. might, they might be qualified. Now, they might have the knowledge, they might have read a lot of books, but you and I know that there are some things that is only after you walk that path that you really can speak with confidence. It's okay to tell somebody before you get married that, you know, hold your peace whenever there's a disagreement, don't say anything when you have different points of view, and then it hits you. How well did you handle it? So if you can handle it, then that makes you a trusted person in that particular area to be able to speak. That's good. I think someone else is asking a question. Yeah. She's saying, thank you so much, Ma. Is it compulsory to have a mentor that you see one-on-one -on -one if most or all of your mentors are afar? Not necessarily. Like one of the things we pointed out is that sometimes you cannot reach your mentors one-on-one, -on -one, but they have materials that you can glean from. Make sure that you constantly do that. There are some people that the only thing It might be that the internet has, is frozen there. Well, can everybody else hear me? To sit with this person yeah. and just be yeah. in a, a forum somewhere. Mrs. So, Rudo, the, just a second, Ma. Your your internet froze a little bit there. So if you could, okay, okay, okay. If you could start again. Okay, sorry. Question, <laughs> okay. So like I was saying, I said it's not necessary for you to have to meet the person one on one. It is possible because we're in an age where most people have put their thoughts down in writing somehow. So it's possible for you to go to the person's page or books or whatever. The key you are looking for will be in their stories, what they are writing. And if you really, if what you are looking for is what the person carries, then go to their materials and begin to glean from it. But from experience, I found out that when you begin to follow somebody closely, the heart of that person begins to respond to you. And you've seen that in the story of Moses and Joshua. Moses was simply, he wasn't looking to lead. He was simply looking to serve Moses, um, Joshua that is. But at the end of the day, when God was to pick somebody, the person whose heart was right was Joshua's heart. And God says, pick Joshua because that spirit is in Joshua. When you begin to follow somebody without even knowing it, the grace upon that person begins to rub off on you. So no, you don't have to see your mentor one-on-one -on -one at, at all. But at some point, you will end up seeing that person on one-to-one. -one. The Holy Spirit has a way of connecting the two of you in one way or the other. Hmm. Very true, very true. And we thank God these days for technology and the various yes. ways that we can always connect with people who we yes. actually 
maybe never even meet face to face, but we yes. can always still connect okay. with them. So true. That's, okay. that's good. Thank you so much for that, Ma. I've got one question, madam. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry for the question. I thought it's a general chat, so I've answered that question. I'm very sorry about that. It's I'm sorry, fine. Austin. <laughs> I've got a question like, how do you respond to a person who wants you to mentor them, but you don't feel like mentoring them? Mm. That is, I think that's where the wisdom of the older one, not in age or the more mature one comes in. Like you can't just tell the person, no, you might decide that the best thing for you to do like the person says oh you know i need help in this area and that area and you know that somehow your heart does not connect to that person what you could do is refer that person to a book or a, a material a, a message a, a, a link somewhere where you say i might not be able to do this because i i, I just wouldn't have the time or the ability to do it for you, but I could refer you somewhere where what you are looking for, you can get. So then you refer the person to this book or this site or this link that that person can take on board and then begin to glean from. So that way you are not crushing the person's spirit by saying, you know what, I'm, you are not good enough for me. The person, because some people, they will say, um, some mentors are snobbish. Some mentors are full of themselves. Some, it might not be. It might just be that the person is too busy. It might just be that the person has other people they are mentoring and they can't take everybody on. So, but people who are on the receiving end, because they are the ones with the need, they are so desperate, like this person is so full of herself or himself. What does he or she think he is? And, and they just want to turn up. So, but when you approach that person with that wisdom of saying, it might be better for you to read this or, you know, go through this. Or if you know somebody who willingly mentor that person, you could actually refer that person to that um, alternative mentor and all that and take it from there. But I think what you've asked me now brings me to a point that I think we should all leave this place with, which is, yes, we're talking about mentoring and being mentored, but I think we should focus more on being mentors to people. Now, there are so many out there that just need guidance, that just need direction. If you look around you, there, there are people, one or two people around you that you have an advantage over. Reach out to them. It, it could be that, you know, by just asking them simple questions or mentioning, advising them, simply put, not the way some people do that, they ram it down your throat. You know what? I want to mentor you. Like, I don't want to be mentored. No, I need to mentor you. You need a mentor. No, not that. But just dropping little tips that will help mm -hmm. the person. What you are doing is helping the person understand the need for it. Now, when you are able to empower that, particularly with people who have experience or with people who are older, look for people who have less experience in that area or who are younger in that area and actually seek to add value to their lives. It will really help. Because one of the things I've noticed is that it's as if, if we don't do that, the next generation will simply be repeating the mistakes we made. And then that makes them suffer what they shouldn't suffer. But when we do it right, then we're actually helping them. Hmm. That's good. We have another um, question. Thank you. Yes. Um, and it says, I have been offered to be mentored by someone, but yes. I, I don't feel it in my spirit. How do I say no without hating them or coming across as if I'm disrespectful? I have prayed about it for a year, but I'm not getting the answer. That is why we mentioned it from the beginning that the idea behind mentoring, it must be done prayerfully. Yes. You cannot force yourself to be somebody's mentor. You cannot force somebody to mentor the person. So if you don't connect with the person, it's a matter of simply 
if the person is a kind that will take offense if you don't say yes, then just use wisdom to maintain a distance between you and that person. Mm -hmm. While being polite, while being respectful, while being still talking with the person, while saying hello and doing every other thing as you should, but you are now keeping that distance between you and the person. After a while, the person will either have to move on or accept that person is unusually, I don't know the word to use, they would understand that there is no connection and they should be able to move on. But if you feel the person is that kind of person that you can actually be honest with, then tell the person. Either I have other mentors or I really don't feel that connection to be mentored by you. But if the person will take offense and it will cause the relationship to be strained, then use wisdom and keep distance between you and the person. Mm. Fantastic. So some appreciation now. Some people are already saying thank you. Adiola yeah. Fajabe is saying thank you, Ma. Nikines Adeja Keomoumi is saying deep wisdom indeed. I've been so blessed. Uh, all right. Austin is saying thank you, Ma. Temito Kwetakpo is saying thank you so much, Ma. Okay, yeah, we've asked this, this question. Uh, Maureen is saying, very powerful and insightful. Once again, thank you, Mrs. Udo. It's a privilege. So <laughs> that, that is awesome. It's a privilege. <laughs> so everyone, thank you again. I'm going to appreciate everyone in a moment, um, but I just want to encourage us all, keep in touch with us. Yes. Um, beyond our Zoom meetings, you can always reach you can reach out to us. I mean, you might remember another question you want to ask. Please feel free to reach out to Mrs. Udo. Her Instagram is at the gifted builder. Um, please, Ma, you might want to tell us how else we can reach you for anyone who wants to reach you beyond uh, this meeting tonight. Okay. Um, you can actually, I think since it's a closed meeting, um, I could actually give you a WhatsApp number. Okay. Then you could send a WhatsApp message if you need to. Or I also have the Facebook platform, um, mm -hmm. Patience Udon. And then the Instagram one is Gifted Builder, just Gifted Builder. But if you send a message to any of these platforms, I'll definitely get it. Fantastic. That's good. That's good. I have two announcements for us on this uh, platform tonight. So let's look at the very first one. We're having a book challenge. And I'm encouraging everyone who don't, doesn't have the book yet, get your copy. I wrote um, I Thrive, the book, last year. So get your copy. It's available on Amazon. We can send you the link. If you can just indicate in the chat box, we'll send you the link. You get your book. And when you get your book, we'll send you, I believe you like this, like what you're seeing here, we'll send you your own free t-shirt, I Thrive t-shirt. So that's the first announcement. That should get us excited. The second, <laughs> the second announcement, we need you and we're asking you to do a video. Say what your highlight has been during this Thrive Key. Some people have been with us right from the very first week. Some people have never missed one week. So do a video of yourself. Say what your highlight has been during the Thrive Key series, and you will get a special gift, either posted to you or delivered to you in person. Um, the due date for this is 17th of September, so we have roughly three weeks to do this. Do a video, say what your highlight has been during this Thrive Keys series. And at this point, every week, we have a verse in the Bible that points to and that speaks about us thriving. You know, I tell us every week that God has awesome plans for you and he, he, his plan, his desire for you and I is to thrive, is to blossom, is to bloom, is to flourish, to make it, and especially to partner with him and make it in what we have been put on this earth to do. So 
I'll have us read this together and, you know, personalize it. Just believe it and receive it and see yourself thrive indeed. All right. Are we all ready to read it? Please unmute yourselves. And this is in quotes because this is the Lord speaking to you personally. It is the word of the Lord to you in Ezekiel 16 and verse 17. And this is in the New King James Version. So please unmute yourselves and let us all read it together. Let's go. I will make you thrive. I will make you thrive like a plant. Become very beautiful and mature and become very beautiful. Oh, that's great. And so shall it be for you and I in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, for 